Due to following CBS School Break Special, Magnum P.I. will not be seen today. It will be broadcast tomorrow in the regular time period. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. For artists that want to follow a realistic style, I don't know that you necessarily have to overthink about an influence like me or any other painter who does realism. You can certainly get a lot from the pieces that we've done, maybe even imitate some of those compositions, but I think you'll find your own way once you're just studying reality, which is what I would do. I mean, if I'm going to look at people, things, photographs, it's beneficial to start shooting your own, if you can get into that. And these days, since everybody's got a camera, that's not so much of an issue anymore. Um, being able to study life as the basis for something is the best. I had the longest problem of thinking I needed to have everybody and every element be perfect before I could use it as a reference source. And so it took me a long time to realize how flexible the basis of the human form is. I've posed her myself on loads of paintings where now I guess I'm called out by some people online. It's a process of getting your mind comfortable with what you're building off of. And at a certain point, I would say, accept that you're going to feel like you're not seeing it until you've seen it. You know, that maybe you do need to have a thing look like a thing exactly before you're, you're painting from it. advertising through television transforms strangers to your product into acquaintances and acquaintances into friends and friends into customers. You could almost say, as a result, that television puts into every living room a selling machine. Welcome back, everybody. It's time again for another episode of Kinescope. Uh, a look back at the era of live television, and man, it's a good one today because we're playing tribute to the comedy genius of Sid Caesar. We're going to talk about uh, both iterations of uh, Caesar's variety show, your show of shows in Caesar's Hour. We're looking particularly at a an episode of Caesar's Hour because uh, Gabe is a particular guy and wanted to make sure that we looked at a full episode because there's tons of sketches on there, but this was a full hour of NBC television of Caesar's Hour. And it's good that we're doing that. So John Sumter's here, Gabe Hardman here, Jeff Parker here. Uh Sid Caesar, everybody. Thoughts? I just want to defend myself for a second here. <laughs> I think that it makes sense to like to just look at a whole episode of something. We can look at a couple other sketches and we talked about those out of context. But I mean it, I, I just think that it, it it this works better when we have some sort of focus instead of just going all over the place. But Anyway, what, uh, <laughs> like, uh, do we do we want to uh, maybe just set up exactly what we're talking about with the uh, with the shows? Like, John, uh, you want to just uh, um, sure. talk about the Caesar's Hour thing? But uh, Jeff, do, do you? Have I, I, I would I would explain to people who don't know about your show of shows and Sid Caesar and Carl Reiner and Howard Morris and Mel Brooks and everybody and uh, the, you know this is where Neil Simon, Woody Allen. Uh, Everybody uh, that's like who became giants in comedy uh, later got their start. Uh, and it's essentially the proto SNL. If instead of being a nebbish, uh, Lauren Michaels was kind of a big, strong, uh, volatile guy. And uh, but but it, essentially, as far as I understand, it worked the same way where they're all in a room. They're competing with each other, trying to get their their routines through Sid's like yang or neighing. This kind of connects also when we were doing about Jackie Gleason, you know, he yes. has, he's in the same situation as Gleason, I guess. And, yeah. uh, you know, and it's like, you know, 
And he really doesn't even know, need to know the hard particulars of the sketch. You almost just need to know the scenario. They all ad lib so well that they can run with a bit. But it has great production value. Well, the, a, both your show of shows and uh, Sid Caesar's Hour have really good production values when they do their whole movie skits. And to my mind, this is what influenced Harvey Kurtzman uh, and doing his movie parodies in Mad. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and they, they became very well well known for these movie parodies. And the, I mean, one of the things that when we think about sketch comedy now, we think about, you know, maybe like five, 10 minute, you know, sketches. And these are 20, 25 minute sketches. They're huge commitments to, to a yeah. gag, you know. So, you know, John, um, what were you going to say? If I'm going to say real fast, because you're right. And in fact, looking at Sid Caesar is a microcosm of what we're doing with this entire series. Because as Jeff said, this is where sketch comedy really evolved and uh the the people that were behind these sketches as uh, jeff said neil simon and uh, carl reiner and mel brooks was a writer and mel tolkien who later became a, an all the family writer and a very important sketch writer all, uh lucille callan and selma diamond we can't we can't not mention the women because that was rare as well but all of them then moved on in the you know, successive decades and made very important movies and important television, important Broadway as well. Uh, people that were behind uh, Bye Bye Birdie and Fiddler on the Roof and other big Broadway plays got their start as a Sid Caesar writer. So what happened was Sid uh, was discovered by Max Liebman. He was a Borscht Belt comic who was working in the Catskills at a at a resort called Tamament, yeah. where all the all all the Jewish people would go on the summer vacations. And hang out in the mountains, and they would go see live entertainment. Max Liebman, the, the producer of your show of shows, would produce these Broadway quality variety shows on the weekends and do like two or three of them a summer. And Pat Weaver tapped him to create a variety show for NBC. And uh, Liebman brought Caesar along, and they were asked at a supposedly very famous lunch. Do you want to do 30 minutes? Do you want to do 60 minutes or 90 minutes? Not realizing he was talking about the show length. And they're like, oh, let's go for the 90. How hard can it be? Little did they know. Because uh, it, it became a grind that, frankly, burnt Caesar out uh, uh, eventually. And, and in fact, Gabe, you say that, and it's true. If people look online, you'll you'll find sketches that are over 20 minutes long. After there was first year, first there was the Admiral Broadway Review, the very first season. And this supposedly is a true story that they canceled it after 17 episodes. And the reason why was Admiral had to decide whether they were going to put their money into making televisions or making this variety show. And the TVs won, as you know, from our intro, television is a great sales uh, machine. Right. But it also, the, the show was also too successful, right? They, like, right. they that is part of why they, they had to pick one or the other. Cause like, you know, they, yeah. they just couldn't do both. Right, it was too expensive to do yeah. both. So NBC was very smart, saw that they had this gold mine of a television show. So from the Admiral Broadway Review, it became your show of shows. Um, a Caesar's original uh, partner, as far as a lot of the sketches, was Imogene Coca. She came along with Admiral. They really started working together more, and we even have a couple of video examples of uh, Sid and Imogene working together. Carl Reiner also came on on the Your Show of Shows first season as the straight man, the classic straight man. And uh, and then uh, Howie Morris also joined as well. Howie Morris, you might remember from uh, Andy Griffith, Ernest T. Ernest Bass. T. Yeah. Absolutely. Howie Morris, to me, I'm, I'm going to glow on him a little bit later because to me, he is the little magic element throughout. Yeah. And that, yeah. There's Definitely a dynamic that he brings to it that I, I'm, but I'm going to get, I'm not going to get ahead or whatever, but I, I, I love Howard Morris. Well, we can either, because I have a couple clips from your show of shows and I have a couple clips from, and I have a clip from uh, Caesar's hour. Um, we can, if you want, from a chronological standpoint, stand, because I've got a couple of the classic sketches yeah. uh, that weren't part of the full hour that we looked at. And um I mean, well, first of all, with Imogene Coca, they She's would do, great. God, yeah, yeah, so and, I mean, and and also, and 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 I picked um, from Here to Obscurity, which is their parody of From Here to Eternity. The reason why I picked it was 
here's a nice soft moment for Imogene Coca. Right. They would do husband and wife sketches. They would do other kinds of great sketches as well. But really, their their great milieu was as as we mentioned with the Kurtzman and um, the other Mad Magazine parodies of movies and stuff. Um, yeah, they really excelled at that. So uh, here's a here's a great scene. It's uh, uh, kind of a combination because if you know from here to eternity. Uh, it was Deborah Carr and Burt Lancaster on the beach making love. Uh, but this is supposedly Montgomery Clift and yeah. uh, Donna Reed, their characters uh, on the beach, essentially. So uh, here we go. Out here on this beach tonight, I can forget the dance hall with all the smoke and the noise and the dancing. <laughs> to hear those words from you, Duchess. Here amongst the ocean, I can see it a different light. See it not as a hard-boiled dancing girl, but as a lost person. And I'm going to find you, whoever you are. Monty, do you really mean that? Every word. Monty, I used to dream of a knight in shining armor who would get... <laughs> That's classic. It yeah, works yeah. so great. Yeah, I mean, this is a you know, this is a parody of the the you know, from here to eternity scene, the love scene on the beach, or the you know, with the, uh, the gentle kind of ocean spray, spray and over and stuff. Yeah, it, but you know, they're literally just with stage hands throwing buckets of water on them. And uh, Imogene Coca is breaking up in this thing, right? She like, buries her head really, so, really you know. hard not to, because apparently it was you know, I, I guess a little bit you know, like SNL. Now it you know Max Liebman was not on board with people uh, breaking character during you know during the show. It's really it was a verboten thing during this. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> you know uh, so like this is one of those rare moments where it was just too absurd of a situation for her to not. She just turned her head all the way around so yeah. you can't see her. It's great, absolutely. And and Caesar was as well. And in fact, Caesar was such a perfectionist. And this is live television. We can't stress it enough. And yet. Um, they would really kind of like, you got to know it. You got to learn it and you've got to know it because this is a performance. Again, they come from live theater and you don't, you don't break character in live theater. So I get it, but I, I believe he was such a perfectionist that in subsequent years, when he would show up on other variety shows, once they had videotape and all that, he was kind of disgusted that people didn't know their lines and had to rely on cue cards. And, and uh, we had to fix it with tape. And he would just get so impatient and be like, uh, you know, uh, well, we didn't have tape. We just had to know it. And I love that it, one of his favorite stories was to talk to college uh, students about live TV. And they're like, we understand it was live. How long did it take for you to make the show? And, you know, meaning like on air. And he's like, right. yeah, 90 minutes. Uh, you know, goes, right. yeah. And they're like, literally would be like, well, what if a bit didn't work and you didn't get a laugh? Well, then we would move a little faster with the next bit. He's just, I mean, it was just so natural of, you know, what do you guys don't understand about live TV? But again, it was a different time. Imagine how much he must have hated the Carol Burnett show. Literally. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I know. It wasn't, you know, for again, it was more just the mechanics of it. Like, oh my God, why are you people just like, get it right the first time? Then it would go easier. Y yeah. It, I mean, that's the thing. Absolutely. And in fact, there's a great uh, 1967 black and white TV um, show that Caesar, Coca, Reiner, and Howard Morris made with a lot of their original Caesar Zauer, Your Show of Shows writers, but the addition of the Dick Van Dyke writers, uh, Bill Persky and uh, Sam Denoff, and it won a lot of Emmys. It is very clunky, and it has it, the advantage. 
Yeah, it is not. It it, it ages worse than the, than the '50s stuff does because I mean, there's a you know, there's a like a long hair rock band sketch and a you know, it just doesn't. It it, it has some bigger problems, even though there's some some good sketches. In it, but yeah, yeah, because um, uh, and it, and they're laying in sound effects and little goofy moments and stuff, and it's like it does not have the energy yeah. that the live stuff did. So um, so anyway, yeah. So your I, show shows went on i want to get to caesar's hour as well and and say that your show of shows started uh it ran for three seasons nbc got the brilliant idea of separating the producer max liebman sid and imaging into three different shows liebman was mostly responsible for a lot of the big musical production numbers and in fact coca was so talented she would dance in a lot of these as well yeah. and they really did kind of feature her dancing and not doing comedy which is kind of cool but yeah. he would make these spectaculars coco they made a, a sitcom which was a really big mistake and a lot of great writers tried to make this sitcom but it just didn't work and then caesar and the remainder of the writers did caesar's hour with a new uh female lead nanette fan bray and the next fan bray man I, I gotta tell you uh i came to her in the 70s, she was Mary Tyler Moore's uh, mom on the Mary Tyler Moore show. Again, another person that would do a lot of sketch and stuff like that. But, man, I got to tell you, uh, she's no Imogene Coca, but she's, I would say, one in 1A. And I think Coke, I think uh, uh, Fabre was very talented. Obviously did movies before, uh, before doing uh, Caesar's Hour and stuff. But she was very capable as well. I just wanted to say about this whole idea of the movie parody thing that um, that the initial um, uh, like initially this was this was something you you know you mentioned Lucille Callan who was one of the you know the first like main couple of writers and to hear her tell it uh, um, you know uh, uh, Mel Brooks was not so much a contributor to the thing and uh, you know and uh, you know like there, there's a lot of running down of Mel Brooks and his and and his actual contributions to stuff in this but uh, when you read about this stuff but uh, but apparently you know they were struggling for material and uh, and she she had written a sketch uh, now I can't remember what a parody of what movie but she had written a movie parody sketch before they had done anything like that and uh, and pitched it and then uh, you know, initially Max Liebman was like, I don't know if the audience is going to get it. Like they, they, they didn't think that, that like a TV audience would be like sharp enough to understand the satire. The, and the reason why was, and I believe I could be wrong, uh, but very early on they were doing foreign movie parodies and that was a very select thing in uh, a, a very few cities. And if you were broadcasting to the heartland, uh, they may not have ever seen um, a French foreign film, a Japanese film, Italian. I, uh, these were of the time and certainly part of uh, the new wave of, I mean, it was France. That well, it, yeah, it, well, that, yeah, and yes, but that was a little bit later than this. But the, but the, okay. um, you know, but like what you're talking about is that, that in like, like in New York where there was like large immigrant, you know, populations or, you know people from who had moved here from other countries yeah. uh the um they you know there would be uh you know bicycle like yeah like well they would run, like they'd run italian movies for i mean martin scorsese talks about being a little kid and seeing you know uh and seeing like italian movies on on tv that were basically just like you know uh they were run for the benefit of uh particular communities and stuff so i mean sure. you're not going to see that in in you know screen whatever <laughs> their, the heart of a lot of their sketches was, too, because they were working so hard on them, uh, taking from real life. And and what did you do this weekend? And, in fact, uh, the ep uh, that's one of the reasons why I was really glad that we found the Caesars Hour one that we did, that the main sketch that really did encompass most of the hour was uh, the idea, and I've got, I've got photographs of that, of uh, a guy who belongs to a, a, a typical kind of... Uh, Gray flan flannel suit executive is uh, on the uh, on the commuter train in the morning, and he's hungover. And uh, there's uh, Carl and and Howie, and apparently he kind of made an ass out of himself at the big country club dinner the night before, and he has no memory of it. And then we go into flashback. But and uh, now the entire skit would simply be that subway bit. It would it would it would just be him getting clues from people like the guy with the, in the arm in the sling coming in 
and the other people, uh, him finding out just how bad an ass of himself he made. Yeah. And it is funny enough just with that. Sure. And then and then it goes on and keeps and and unwinds the entire night. Uh, right. And I mean, you see him, you see him at his uh, country club meeting, and he's the recorder, and he's kind of, I mean, he's been there two years, but a big promotion. And then once they make him in charge of the entertainment committee for a big soiree, suddenly becomes you know an asshole and uh, yeah, very demanding. That was that was one of the best turns because he does so fast. Yeah, that was my favorite bit in that. Well, and Um, the guy, I mean, as great and in fact, we see it in our in our lobby card for this episode. uh, The physicality of Sid Caesar, as much as his dialects and and other things he was able to do. I mean, they they were so important to uh, him projecting character. And that's why some of these foreign films and other things. And again, I've got an exa- I've got I've got a great example of a silent film we'll get to uh, that a parody that they do. Um, yeah, he was just he was just so amazing. And so and, and ironically was so good at his characters that when you asked him to just introduce the show as Sid Caesar, he's he you can see the fear. It's in awkward, his Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he is really awkward trying to be himself. Um, the one of the uh, the things that um, uh, it, it it's kind of interesting that you're not getting if you don't have any context for any of this is that like this show was just hipper than other shows were at the time, right? Like we were talking, uh, you know, uh, I, I think last week about Ed Wynn and about that kind of baggy pants comedian type stuff, and the uh, and you know, this is a show where. You know, they're doing foreign film parodies and they're doing, I mean, it's stuff that obviously the broader physical stuff can play, you know, uh, to a broad audience in, in television. But uh, but there was just something that it was just like a, a more sophisticated kind of like a, a hipper kind of comedy than what you were getting otherwise and what you would expect it out of television at the time. Yes. Yeah, Caesar would talk about um, an early sketch of, again, did anyone do, any, do anything this weekend? And if they didn't do anything... Did your neighbors do anything this weekend? And supposedly the anecdote was, yeah, you know, uh, somebody got, uh, my, my friend got uh, two tickets to a Broadway opening or six tickets to a Broadway opening. And they created a bit about it on the mm-hmm. phone of how do you uh, coordinate working people all getting together last minute who have this opportunity to see a live Broadway show that night and who's going to pick up who and where's my, where's my tux and, you know, find find my uh, jewelry, blah blah blah, and also they were able to split screen live TV and have cameras, you know, aimed at different people, and that was a massive uh, revelation as opposed to the one camera baggy pants Edwin sort of classic vaudeville stuff that, and even Milton Berle was was you know doing that, and it was very popular. Caesar and Berle were absolutely absolutely contemporaries. Uh, uh, the Admiral Review and I believe uh, um, Milton Berle's show both started in 48. Yeah, and I think that so. Caesar's first television appearance was on Berle's show. Uh, or at least that's what I read. Okay. Um, the, but, uh, you know, just in a guest part or something. But sure. like, uh, but what you're talking about is that they're using the medium of television in order to like, you know, innovate the way that the comedy works as opposed to just aiming a camera at something and, and you know, photographing vaudeville. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and again, this murderous row of writers can't be overstated because, again, you got Neil Simon, you got his brother Danny, who was a very big TV writer as well. You got, like I said, the original writers were Mel Tolkien and Lucille Callan. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and Sid and Max Liebman. Um, Mel came in as a guy that Sid knew from the neighborhood. And uh, essentially was paid out of Sid's pocket, was not a real uh, writer, uh, you know, on on the show until the second season Mm -hmm. of uh, your show of shows. And would only make write special material for Sid, some solo sketches, things like that. But also um, was that guy in the room that would just come up with a great line. But it, yeah, but it, although the you know also people people said that he would come up with like a hundred lines, uh, right. you know, a day, and two of them would be great. But the right. but like I mean you know there's nothing wrong really wrong with that. But all of the stories that everybody uh, I'm not here to knock Mel Brooks. I think he's great. But uh, all, all I'm just you know I'm just yeah. Being the person. You in that book? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, it's John's book. But actually, the, uh, yes, I, we'll talk. But, about it. but the uh, but like the uh, I. I 
you know, he, I think all the stories that we think are so great about him, you know, uh, you know, at like midway through the afternoon after never showing up all morning, just like bursting through the door and yelling safe. And, you know, like all the stuff that the kind of Mel Brooks, the antics, I think to the other people who had to actually sit down and write the show was just irritating, you know, yeah. I, which, I mean, you could just imagine, I don't know. I just think it's, it's worth thinking about being the actual person doing the work, writing the script and everything and having this nut in there uh, who is bringing great stuff probably, well, but also is not really pulling his weight. Well, he's probably, he's young at that point. And he, he's, you know, it's the first of the, as far as I can trace back the dangling out the window stories that like you keep, we always heard this in comics, like one, one, day, one story, it's Alex Toth holding Julie Schwartz or whoever out a window. Then, and then it's, um, uh, you know, Mooney or somebody like that. And I don't think it ever happened in comics at all. I think they're all Sid Caesar holding Mel Brooks out the window. Yeah. Yeah. And I doubt he's really dangling him. He's probably just like, probably going, yeah. get your fresh air or whatever after right. he pops the window open. It happened, every, it happened in Chicago at the Palmer House, supposedly, when Sid right. was doing like six or eight shows a day, uh, you know, and there was no time to do anything. And Brooks is like, I want to go out. And he's like, look, I just want to eat my dinner in my room and relax. Can we, you know, I want to go out. And finally, apparently, Sid grabs Mel, holds him out the window. You want out? Here's out. OK. All right. right. It is good. It is good. But right. here's a great picture of the writers uh, back in their prime. So I want to make sure. All right. So I'm going to go from right to left on the first of all, the top row. All right. So you got that with the glasses. That's Larry Gelbart, who led developed MASH. And prior to Sid Caesar was a Bob Hope writer. That's Mel Tolkien, I believe, next to him. And then uh, after or it's Danny Simon. I'm not sure because that's Neil Simon on that top row as well. Right. And you got Mel right underneath Larry Gelbart and uh, um I guess is that I'm not sure who that is in the center. I'll be honest. Uh, I'm assuming that might be either Mike Stewart or Tony Webster, who are those Broadway writers later because he's behind the typewriter. Hmm. And I don't know who that is. I'll be honest. But then here's another, Oh, I, I haven't put it up yet. I've got a later picture of them from the nineties showing the class of writers. Woody Allen is always lumped in with those guys. And Woody did work on um, a bunch of specials that were after your show of show and Caesar's Hour, and uh, for I believe uh, CBS and ABC, Sid did these specials. And by the way, one thing I wanted to make uh, clear as well: uh, when, um, as I, as we said, Caesar's Hour and your show of shows would do these more than twenty minute long sketches, one sketch, and um, ABC proposed that Caesar could do a half hour, and he's like, without commercials, that's twenty four minutes. I have nothing to say in a period as short as 24 minutes. And I love that. I love that. And it's, you know, it's, I mean, he even went to the BBC and did a version of his, a half hour version of his show that was over the heads of most of the British public. But again, the hipsters got it among them. Peter Cook uh, loved Sid Caesar and would always cite Sid Caesar as a massive influence on the sketch stuff that he and Dudley Moore later did. So that's kind of cool. You know, here's here's that picture of uh, the group. And there you got, all right, so you got Carl, Carl Reiner there. There's Woody sitting down. I believe that's Larry Gelbart next to him. Um, again, not sure who that dude is. There's Sid in the, uh, they're, they're near the center right at the fold of the magazine there. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, I, well, yeah, I the, the resolution of the JPEG makes it a little difficult. But the um, yeah. like the uh, um, one of the things that though that people uh, that or at least I o had always assumed until you know, I mean, a long time ago, but still, like uh, that Carl Reiner was one of the writers on the show, and he wasn't. He was just a performer. I mean, just because he so brilliantly went, you know, and 
you know, wrote the whole first season of the Dick Van Dyke show after this. And very much in the vein of this kind of thing we're talking about the uh, with, I mean, not only, you know, is it a, you know, show he business makes workplace it about thing. the thing he did. Yeah, That's it's really great. Yeah, it's both like a, you know, a show business writer's room, you know, comedy, but it's also about New Rochelle. It's also about the, uh, you know, the suburban life that, you know, uh, and, you know, very much like what we're talking about in the Caesars Alley. It's funny because Carl Reiner brings in like, you know, uh, Maury Amsterdam and uh, um, Rosemary. Rosemary, God. Sorry, Rose. Uh, still around. The uh, oh, she passed. She passed. Yeah. That yeah. pretty recent. Yeah. I was doing something. Anyway, uh, well, Dick Van Dyke's still here, damn it. Yeah. Um, he yeah. still pops up on Twitter. But, you know, in, in, in their scenario, it's always those are the two that are always like suggesting, hey, why don't we do an old vaudeville routine every time? Right. And Dick is clearly the young hip guy who's changing TV. Right. 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 Or whatever. So it's like, it's kind of an interesting little analysis of what he dealt with originally carl reiner is so smooth as the straight guy yeah who is funny because the straight guy can't really just be straight he's got to actually be funny but in a di different way than everybody else and depending on the sketch sometimes he was the funny guy too i've got a yeah. great here here's a uh again a great example of them doing a movie parody uh this was called aggravation boulevard and uh, I'll I'll let it run, and then uh, and this is a good example of Carl being a straight man, but uh, and then and then that Fabre in this scene as well. <laughs> but Mr. Florence, this is important. Look, look at today's variety. It better be important. It means your job. Movies talk, sound comes to the screen. Silent movies doomed. Oh, Flo, what does this mean? Does this mean? It means a new era has opened up for motion pictures. We'll scrap this picture and make it over in sound. We'll hear the sound of hoofbeats. We'll hear cannons roar. We'll hear birds singing. Rex, my boy, Rex, do you realize what talking movies will mean for you? At last! <laughs> At last, the world will hear me talk! The world will hear Rex Hansen talk! I'll talk, I'll talk, I'll talk, I'll talk! <laughs> And look, they're only like 60 years ahead of the Coen brothers doing this in Hail Caesar. Yeah. Oh, the, well, and but around the same time as uh, as uh, uh, Singing in the Rain. Dude. But yeah. Yes, but, <laughs> you know. but uh, a different way. And also. Yeah, no, it's just, I mean, I'm not, this is, I'm not saying it's, a, it's, it's a very different sort of take yeah. on it. It's a very broad sort of, you know, yeah. Well, totally. it's a, it's a great combination of Rudolph Valentino, who died before the sound era and, uh, and John Gilbert who was a leading man who did suffer and really did not have a bad voice. He just didn't have a commanding voice. It wasn't as ridiculous. It's that, yeah, it's that Gilbert's uh, voice didn't match the persona that he'd already like established in the silent movies. Right. I mean, people expected him to be, you know, to have this kind of commanding gravitas because of his, you know, because of like, yeah, because of that persona. He That's what you imagine. Right? Yeah. But they were, yeah. They were such connoisseurs of foreign films and silent films. Uh, I, I didn't pull a clip from it, but one of the great Caesar sketches that features Sid and Howie Morris is this uh, seemingly German general getting ready uh, to go out. And he's got a little, you know, sidekick that's just kind of straightening his outfit and making sure he looks good and everything. And, and it really is, I guess, a parody of the Emil Jennings. Uh, last laugh uh that of course was the inspiration for the joker as we know from a from comic book standpoint uh, uh, that's not right sorry the, the, that's the man who laughed that's the that's um uh, the, oh, uh, conrad, the, uh conrad Veidt in the man who laughed uh you know uh the last laughs of fw murnau movie with the uh, sorry sorry okay no 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 I, no 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 let's be accurate Wait. no i appreciate it okay that. now to go back to the one we uh only touched on before with the whole the the extremely uh, long one with Peggy Lee yeah. doing musical numbers in it, yeah. Where that's where you get the thing where like they don't try, they do get some good laughs off of Peggy Lee, but when she sings, they they bolt. You know, it's like it's all about her performing, and and then it returns to being a comedy after she's done. But in that one, it's kind of interesting because when you turn Sid Caesar loose 
with the other actors and stuff, his whole kind of angry drunk thing uh, seems extremely menacing and a little too real uh, to the point where you're going, I don't know if I should be laughing at this. But when you get Carl Reiner and Howard Morris with him doing the same thing, they know how to to play off of it and make it seem tamer and and more for laughs. And others, you think, man, I think Sid's going to kill these people. Yeah, and I think that that's like I think that you're exactly right that the supporting you know actors are bringing this sort of different dimension at, to what Sid Caesar is doing. He really was a, a, a rage filled alcoholic, right? That that yeah. was you know that was him in real life, you know, and, uh, that's why and he I think nailed that, it. <laughs> yeah, well, but also, but that by itself, you know, I mean, like you know, he he's obviously playing funny. He's playing broad and everything i'm not saying he's not but he you know but the but i think that there's an edge to him that also that you know when playing off the other people kind of makes it more palatable you know yeah when you get howard morris who's like this squirrely wiry physical guy who's kind of frank gorshany and his ability to cling around to the set jump on people do all kinds of stuff or whatever it, it, it sort of it either mitigates or, or it, it transforms what Caesar's doing and it gets more out of it. Um, when, it when it's just Caesar just being his own show, I don't think it works as well. Yeah, I agree. Well, and again, it depends on the bit. I mean, uh, they they have a film of his first bit where uh, he shows the difference when he only has five dollars and what five dollars would buy in the the 30s and what it buys today as far as a date and it's just Sid doing pantomime and and then singing along and everything and it's you know it's great the other thing is he made a great there's um uh, a pro uh, military film from re the recruiting days of World War II called Tars and Spars and it's about the Coast Guard and Sid was in the Coast Guard and in fact that's where Max Liebman, uh, disco Liebman discovered him and he would do a World War One flying ace bit, and it's all Sid making sound effects and doing his thing, and it really is vintage Caesar. Yeah. And you can find that clip online as well, and it's it's and, great. So again, depending, uh, but but you're right. I mean, this is again the era of Jackie Gleason and Bang Zoom to the Moon. Yeah, like haha. -ha. So Abusive yeah, husband, yeah. this is hilarious. Right, but I mean, I don't think that, I'm not I'm not being critical of it like that. I'm not saying that there, there's something inappropriate about it. I'm just talking about like the different tension that the actors are bringing and the way they play off of each other and how yeah. that's kind of needed. I mean, yeah. you were talking about the doing the German general thing and stuff like that. And like, and like a huge part of uh, Sid Caesar was this double talk mm -hmm. thing where he would, uh, you know, he would talk as if he were uh, speaking in German or Italian or something, but there, it was really just gibberish that right. kind of, mo you know, uh, replicated the kind of tone and sounds but didn't he had no idea what he was saying right and right. that and that's a huge thing i mean i guess that he's kind of started that in childhood and you know had you yeah, know, his, is it like a a, th a thing that he always did his parents owned uh a diner and uh it was near a couple factories and there were a lot of immigrants of different nationalities working there and they would break off and when they'd go to lunch they'd be in conversation i saw this with my aunts who worked in the pharmaceutical company and it was a total United Nations of literally like Laverne and Shirley conveyor belt women that spoke broken English to each other. And it wasn't that far from just hand gestures and, and explaining what was going on uh, nationality to nationality. So, yes, yeah, Caesar grew up around all that stuff. And, and that's where he would approximate these languages. And it was fun. It was cute. Um, it may be considered and I'm not saying that uh, we're dis we're saying anything disparaging today it might be considered mocking and out of I I, I, I think this is one of those circumstances where you're you're overstepping your you know uh your your assumptions about that I don't think it's actually offensive and I don't really think that it's whatever people would be I mean, well, definitely not uh, and the German stuff's still funny exactly <laughs> uh, look we, that, that'll never not be funny yeah That's, no they they earned the lifetime <laughs> mocking award so yeah there you go. Yeah. Are we gonna are are you gonna show any of the very funniest skit of your show of shows? Probably if you mean this is your life. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was I mean, again, there are as we've just in recent episodes, there are game show parodies, there are a lot of parodies of, of film and everyday life. 
And this is your life. If you don't know it by name, uh, it does explain what the premise is. Uh, Ralph Edwards, the host, would uh, find people, both famous people and ordinary people, and uh, shock them with a book. And all of a sudden, you know, whether they were in their regular life or, or sometimes on the street, sometimes in the theater. Um, well, let's just. Or, first or of all, they already uh, really unfairly shocked them, like telling. Uh, Laurel and Hardy that we've got work for you and then rope them into the studio That's true. to then find out they're on a goddamn game show. Yeah, when probably, you know, the, the only thing that these guys would, you know, like are desperate for is, you know, some kind of job at that point, some something where they're doing the thing that they do. It, it's, it breaks my heart to watch that. that well, this is, I, uh, I can't stand it. I've got it in two different segments. First of all, this shows, and it's a little blurry, but this shows uh, Carl Reiner's strength as a straight man. And this was shot at the city theater or the center theater, but they had 5,000 seats. They would do a live television show in front of 5,000 people. That's amazing. Yeah. But that's, this is the novelty of television. And truly it was, it was uh, your show of shows and Caesar's Hour were beating Broadway and people were staying home Saturday nights to watch that. Or if they were lucky enough to get a ticket, they could watch uh, this parody of This Is Your Life. Welcome, America, and hi there, everybody. Once again, we present This Is Your Story. As you know, each week, we give you the intimate inside story of some person's life. Now, that person might be anywhere in the audience tonight. You don't know who it is, and your neighbor sitting next to you doesn't know who it is. The only people who know who it is are we people backstage. Now, could it possibly be your life, sir? I know. <laughs> or could it possibly be your life, sir? Well, then it could possibly be... It could possibly be your life, sir. Yes, sir. This is your story, Al Dunsey. <laughs> seems to be a little overwhelmed by Al. <laughs> He's a little Al. Al Dunsey. Al. Al boy. This is your story, Al. Now come on up here, Al. What? Yes, sir. Come on up here, Al. <laughs> So, and in fact, I have another clip from, from the bit because it, it shows. Oh, yeah, we got to get to the the, yeah. the things. But how, how fun must that have been for the live audience? Oh, yeah. Because I like to think Sid was sitting out there way ahead of time to not ruin the surprise of it. You see, like, when they're going out there, like, one guy's totally covering his face. Like, he's so deathly afraid for some reason they're going to bring him up. And, uh, and a lot of people are like that. 
or the the people even waving. Hey, we're on TV. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it's a skit, it's like they're not going to get you. you know? like, and as I understood it, because I, I uh, again, go to the archive of American television, watch Sid Caesar's interview. It's fascinating. And apparently at the um, city or center theater, they had a giant screen uh, that they would show to the audience, kind of like rock, rock uh, concerts today, so that if you did have a lousy seat, you could watch the screen and see what was going on. But yeah, just the amount of pandemonium of of going back and forth, and that sustained laugh that was over like ninety seconds long, and they just didn't stop laughing. Yeah, the his ushers ushers is. tackling him and and dragging him back. It's great stuff. It is. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. And now uh, again, one of the things that was always really annoying about, and I grew up on this is your life. Uh, they they had subsequent versions well into the eighties, even a great British version of the show as well. Mm -hmm. But. Um, you know they would get these old people from uh, from from uh, people's life. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, they're they're all like barely alive. They're just like propped up, <laughs> and you and they're having to act like they remember these people. You remember this? So yeah, here's uh, here's an example of that. Hello, Al. Remember me? I used to encourage you. I helped you in those desperate years when you needed help. Uh, Uncle Goopy. <laughs> So yeah, oh, Uncle Goopy. Yeah, so people like refer to this sketch as the Uncle Goopy sketch a lot of the time as well. I mean, yes, like one of the, the key things people talk about. I mean, it's a it's a ten minute sketch, and again, the physicality of both Caesar and Howie Morris. One of the great things about Howie Morris being so tiny and Sid Caesar being such a stalker, as they say in Yiddish, just a big, <laughs> strong brute of a man. He could literally pick him up and carry him around. And at one point, Uncle Goopy just latches himself. Yeah, he's on his back. <laughs> and then he's walking around with uh, with Howie Morris, just just clinging to his leg like a four year old. And again, it's just and that and that crying <laughs> face that both of them make and stuff it's it's outstanding so yeah. it, what makes it so work so well is they'll take just a, just a few seconds like they're going to get their composure and then they see each other again and immediately go into it it gets me every time it's oh, hilarious yeah. no again and that's a great thing man i mean it really was at the same time both a great physical show and then a very hiply written smart show with good lines and funny shit and it's uh it, truly it's it's a marvel of its time and really, I mean, to put it in baseball terms than they have before, it was these writers were like the 1927 Yankees. I mean, just top to bottom, so many great writers that uh, made this incredible stuff for uh, seven years, four years of, um, or maybe eight years. But yeah, I believe it was uh, three three or four years of uh, your show of shows and then another four of uh, Caesar's Hour. And it just burned itself up. And of course, as we know from, um, you can't do twenty years of uh, skits for that long. It's just well, yeah. look at look yeah. at how Saturday Night Live has had to morph into different uh, versions of itself, and also suffer some tough, shitty seasons. Frankly, yeah. Well, there's not just one. You know, these, there's not just this core group of people who've gone through all of Saturday Night Live. I mean, you know, the original right. cast barely lasted the first five years right i mean right. they were already peeling off you know uh, no, but right. it, uh the but yeah and and you know he he was also a you know an alcoholic he had rage problems he was not somebody who like could play well with you know with the with the rest of show business and it really hurt his career afterwards well yes and no because that's not exactly true he made a he and neil simon made a made a made a play called little me it was a massive Broadway hit in the early 60s. Um, 
I mean, but really after that, John, he had struggles with stuff and it hurt his career. That's just yeah, true. No, yeah. I realize that Gabe, but there was a period that was post your show of shows for give the edge where he continued to succeed. So, uh, sorry. Uh, you guys uh, yeah, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Giving one example is the exact way that well, making, was, yeah, making arguments it, doesn't work. Gabe, it wasn't, the, <laughs> it was a Broadway <laughs> show game. It wasn't, it wasn't a show like, Hey man, Sid was really funny Saturday night, but the rest of the time he was shit. I, I'm sorry. I, and again, television okay. was willing to still take a chance of, with him with diminishing results into the early sixties. And that's where you had the Woody Allen period. One of his, uh, and I haven't seen it. Uh, this is based on anecdotal research, but, um, or example, um, he had one of his specials and it was Art Carney and Shirley MacLaine. So it wasn't the regular Caesar people. And that was an incredible variety uh, hour that he made. That is one of those single examples. So oh, again, I don't deny what you're saying, Gabe, but I'm just saying there was a period before the fall and the and the really uh, the wilderness years of Caesar well, where he still but, succeeded. Yeah, yeah, he, he burns out. Yeah. He burned yeah, anyway, but then he about the time he burns out and people are essentially throwing him a bone, like come on my show, blah blah blah, here and there. Right. This is the point where Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks are just going up and up. You know, Brooks does yes. the producers. Carl Reiner starts doing all these Steve Martin movies. You know, it's just well, like, the 70s, sure. But I mean, let's, you know, again, let's not forget Dick Van Dyke. And, you yeah, know, Dick Van Dyke's all, all five time seasons of Dick Van Dyke. Timer. Right. It's one of the, the top 10 best TV shows ever. It, it really is. I mean, yes. without question. Yeah. Yes. Well, and that's the other interesting thing is so Reiner's version of what happened in, in backstage at the Caesar show is Dick Van Dyke. Then, of course, in the early 80s, uh, Norman Steinberg brings Mel Brooks' My Favorite Year, and uh, there's Joe Bologna playing the Sid Caesar character, King Kaiser, next to his producer. And there's a shot of the writer's room, and you get Bill Macy being amazing. And uh, it's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, great early 80s movie, 1982, I believe. Uh, Mark yeah, Lynn Baker and, uh, and Peter O'Toole. And essentially, Peter O'Toole playing kind of an Errol Flynn, swashbuckling old Hollywood actor who's going to appear on this Sid Caesar variety show, Mark Lynn Baker playing a version of Mel Brooks, whose job it is to keep him sober and keep him showing up on rehearsals and ultimately the live performance. And it's a fantastic movie. Richard Benjamin directed it. It's amazing. Well, you yeah, got so it on, on the Dick Van Dyke show. Carl Reiner is playing Sid Caesar. He's always screaming at everybody. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. He's yeah. ripping his toupee off and yelling at people. Yeah, and everything, and I don't know who Mel Cooley's supposed to be. He's just funny because he's Richard Deacon. Yeah, you know, what, what, well, one of our, our greatest performers. Yeah, um, <laughs> the, <laughs> um, but what? Yeah. Uh, he he he's great. Uh, the, but um, yeah, but uh, as far as my favorite year goes, I, I do think that just uh, talking about it as a movie. I mean, I think that the Peter, the Peter O'Toole and uh, Marklin Baker relationship is what makes the movie. Sure. Uh, and it's uh, you know, I mean, there's certainly uh, good stuff in and around that stuff. I mean, I think that the, uh, um, I mean, I understand the uh, wait. Joe Bologna is that the correct? Yeah, Joe yeah. Bologna plays King. Joe Bologna. Yeah. Uh, you know, he like. You see why they cast him as that, but I don't know that he's. I don't think he. I've, he's a little TV actorish for me. But uh, also, oh. look, I got this one giant criticism of this movie. Right? Tell me, the fucking hair, right? Everybody's hair is 1982, and it's like, what are? Is everybody blind? Like what? I mean, why he just style his hair in a way that looks like it's in the 50s? You know, like it drives me insane. This is not well, really a giant criticism of the thing. It's that's just why I hate war movies of the time, and yeah, especially happiness. war movies. I really hate when you get a war movie of the time, and they have modern haircuts. It used to just, just piss me it's off. So baffling. Bad. I know actors don't want to cut their hair, but come on, like this is you know, you like grow back. Yeah, yeah, and I, just at I, least I, makes the tiniest effort. Like again, you put, happy, you put them in suits. You know, yeah, well, happy eleven is garbage year. though. We're talking about this being year. a good movie. Yeah. But the yeah. like so like just I'm not it's... disagreeing with you. <laughs> but like you Kelly's know Kelly's Heroes just... is the only movie I tolerated in for war movies. Yeah, well, that's deliberately anachronistic. So yeah, then, yes. I mean, yes. you know, but like uh just I don't get it, but this is a big problem for me. 
It no, I understand. Mean it's a bad I, movie. I actually like the movie. But it's no, and then, and then until the later 80s, it seemed like people finally like, okay, let's get the haircuts right. Let's actually I mean, do this. The one way I kind of understand this, right, is if this is 19, if this is 1982, they're basically hearkening back 30 years. Uh, right. If I think right. back 30 years, I don't know that I'd be that great at figuring out what the haircuts look like off the top of my head either. There's a little bit of, you know, sad old man blindness to this where you, you know, right. where you stop seeing, uh, you know, the, the subtleties and the changes of stuff. Sure. Anyway, we well, should not have spent this much time on the hair. It just is it's something that bugs me. Well, we have. Uh, yes, we have. Uh, and also at the same time as my favorite year, Neil Simon creates laughter on the 23rd floor. And uh, this is a clip from... Uh, the Showtime uh, uh, movie, movie adaptation of this. Interesting that Showtime always does these movie adaptations of some of these subjects. So uh, Nathan Lane plays the Sid Caesar character. Um, that's Saul Rubinick, who's basically Mel Brooks. Right. And then you got Dan, uh, Dan Casaletta. And I forget this guy's name, but he's essentially Larry Gelbart. Um, Who are the two guys uh, whose heads are cut off? Uh, God, I wish I could remember. Um, but uh, there's Mark Lynn Baker, who ironically in this movie uh, plays Mel Tolkien, who was a, a uh, an immigrant uh, Russian Jewish Jewish man who immigrated to Canada. That's where he learned his English and always had this wonderful Russian accent throughout his life. And I think Mel, uh, Mel or Mark Lynn Baker does a great job copy, uh, uh, capturing it. Uh, Sal Rubinick, uh, I think, uh, projects... Oh. The amount of annoyance that Mel Brooks could, uh, you know, deliver. I, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this this version of the. I uh, haven't actually seen this. No. Okay. And that, and that was Perry Gilpin, right? Perry Gilpin plays uh, Lucille Callan, essentially yeah. kind of a role. Yeah, from Frasier. Um, it's a great movie. It's a. I mean, I mean, I've seen it as a movie. I know it's a play. There are actually productions of it as a play that you can watch on YouTube. I wasn't able to find uh, the film version of this. And Nathan, you know, I don't know. Nathan Lane, he's no Sid Caesar. That's all I'll say. I mean, he does fine for what he does. He's no Zero Mustel. I'll right. Get, I'll do you one better. He's no Oscar <laughs> Madison either, I'll be honest. And I know he and Matthew Broderick, after the producers, uh, did The Odd Couple. And I love I, – I like Nathan Lane a lot. I think he's a very – I mean, and wow, there's a bold statement to make that Nathan Lane is a funny guy. That's – I'm not – I'm not – I wasn't convinced with him as – the Caesar character that yeah. he was supposed to do. Look, he's no BB Rebozo, you know? He's no uh <laughs> I'm sorry. Nice. Can you do a whole show where you just say Nathan Lane is no and fill in the blank with <laughs> Yeah, there's a laundry list of what he's not. But he's uh, no but he's, Pitts. he's no uh <laughs> he's no Frank McHugh. Yeah, uh, who, who's been on my mind this week because he's no James Franciscus. He's no sugar. He's Smallhouse. no James Franciscus. <laughs> yeah, he's no sugar small house. Thank you. Absolutely, but it God, is I love interesting. That name. That's the best character name. I'm so jealous of it. <laughs> it is interesting through uh, the prisms of of Reiner, uh, my favorite year, and laughter on the twenty third floor with Simon. Uh, the different points of view of of what that writer's room was like. So, um, yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, I guess that, back then, I guess that when you're when you got a big successful thing like that, you can you can afford to fill the room with funny people and just take what is working. And they're 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 putting the unfortunate kind of held position of having to come up with something on the spot, which is not really the way writers tend to work. No. Uh, <laughs> typically they like to stew on something a little bit but there there was no time for that yeah. no i mean they had to they had to be uh up and rehearsing and figuring out sets and stuff by wednesday for this saturday night show so they really i mean and that's one of the reasons why caesar claims you know i i couldn't sleep i it was always on my mind i could never relax um you know and uh and so he turned to drink and then also he added uh, i forget which drug it was the same drug that killed Marilyn Monroe, where he was uh, drinking and taking the drug to help him sleep and everything. Right. And again, he was burnt out. I mean, uh, really, the the ultimate uh, thing was he was burnt out. Uh, his um, autobiography, which is called "Where Have I Been," I think is great, and I think reasonably honest in terms of his personal demons, why he turned to drink, but he cleaned himself up in the early eighties. He was still kind of a mess even when he made Greece in the late 70s. 
But by the early 80s, he kind of cleaned himself up. By Greece, uh, too, he cleaned himself up, right? Right. That's uh, what I was going to say. That, yeah. yeah, Greece, too, he did clean himself yeah. up. But also, um, he was doing 80s television during the Fred Silverman NBC years. They had a show called The Big Show that would feature him in, in comedy sketches. And he worked with Steve Allen and he even worked with Pink Lady and Jeff, that fine uh, variety show. That yeah, we all remember I mean, well, there you I go. mean it, it's it's nice that we have an arc that builds to Pink Lady and Jeff here. Yeah. Look, but I mean, of course, the, the epitome, I, the, the Jeff Altman. Uh, yeah, Nathan Lane is no Jeff Altman, but I I think that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but he, and then of course Vegas Vacation. He has a great little cute cameo in that. And, his, and uh, his... yeah, well, and you know, following the tradition of uh, Imogene Coca in the original Vacation, right. Absolutely. They even, I remember in the 70s, they had a, a, an HBO special called A Touch of Burlesque. And it was them performing their old routines and, uh, and, and then surrounded by burlesque dancers, stripping but not going all the way, obviously. And also mentioning the 70s, I don't know whose idea it was, but they created a film called 10 from Your Show of Shows. And it was 10 sketches from the old variety shows. And they played as a, as a feature film. College kids rediscovered Sid Caesar. And it really was part of that new appreciation of classic comedy that Groucho also was able to enjoy. And um, I don't know about uh, Keaton or Chaplin. I, I, well, actually, I do know because the posters were there. I mean, there really was this appro uh, appreciation of old Hollywood uh, in the early seventies. And luckily uh, Caesar with 10 from your show of shows cut a, a piece of that. Well, and then 20 years later, like wh what was that? Uh, what was that movie? Billy Crystal plays the comedian who's of the era. Oh, Mr. Saturday night. Yeah. And then yeah. You, you see him watching your show of show. And it's the, it's the uncle goofy episode. And Billy Crystal's like, like it's just one of these things where later he explains it off the movie uh you know this like he's just kind of stunned by it because it's so funny that he's not laughing but you kind of don't get that from the movie oh i do i mean he's got this look on his face like he's pissed and it's like yeah why why isn't my stuff as funny or he's a little godstruck or whatever or, or received as well as Sid Caesar. and that's I'm a real I didn't take it that way i took it okay. that's that's interesting cuz i took it as he knew it was really good, and it's it it was hurting to see somebody up there just really killing it, you know, where you would like to see you doing it. He's not so much jealous as like, holy shit, he's acknowledging how good it is. It's in my mind, I always bring up this scenario, this one little uh the thing of Robin Williams and Billy Crystal. And Whoopi Goldberg would always do their fundraiser. Comic relief. Yeah. And uh, the first year they had Bob Odenkirk and David Cross on there. I, actually, it's probably the only time they ever had them on there. And uh, where are they? Radio City Music Hall? Maybe? Sure. Yeah, so let's just say they are. Yeah. Or whatever. So as much like season ticket holders who are probably watching this. But... Uh, you know, they're bringing out various comedians throughout the whole thing and they're doing whatever shtick or timely thing they are. And, you know, and you can see Robin Williams like wanting to be competitive with everybody. Like Robin Williams appreciates the comedians and Billy Crystal seemed to get a little intimidated because like uh, Bob and Dave do this one skit where Odenkirk goes in the back and they're they're doing an improv thing and he, he convinces him to take all his clothes off and come back out on the stage. And then Odenkirk actually comes out naked. He's literally holding his crotch, going up on stage, and they're doing a thing, and it's hilarious. Yeah, and it's, it's the, yeah. And it's, you know, to skip the pun, it's the ballsiest thing I think they probably ever had happen or whatever, and they do the whole routine. It's a hilarious routine. Um and then it always stuck with me because Robin Williams and Billy Crystal come back out. And Billy Crystal looks like someone has run over his mom in front of him. And I, and to, to me, I took that the same way. Like he's like, I just saw somebody willing to go farther for a joke than I have ever done in my life. 
and that's Odenkirk. And that's why Odenkirk's where he is now, I think. You know, he's like he he commits to the bit. Yeah. You know? yeah. The the contemporary version of that to Caesar was Jack Carter. And I didn't know this up until about 10 or 15 years ago. Jack Carter also had an NBC Saturday night show that preceded Caesar's 90 minute show it was an hour long and it was actually from Chicago. I wish there was uh, kinescopes of it, but there isn't. And um, it only lasted a year and it mm-hmm. paled in comparison to Caesar's show and NBC decided to stick with Sid and not, and cancel Carter's show. And uh, you know, Carter, man, you want to talk about a guy that was bitter and then, you know, uh, frustrated and stuff. Uh, you know, on the one hand, a lot of entertainment people would go and visit Caesar in his declining years because he ended up getting Alzheimer's really bad. And he was also kind of sickly and bedridden at the end. And uh, Reiner and Brooks would bring a group of, of young entertainers and old entertainers. I know Monty Hall was part of that group and he would go. Carter was part of that group as well. But a lot of times would just start yelling and complaining about how screw, screwed he got. And ultimately it was like, Jack oh, God, Stop. that's awful. That's Jack Carter. Yeah. That's that's about, no one wants to be the act that goes on before the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. And then yeah. that's yeah. at some point everybody is. But it, yeah. but I, I appreciate that, uh, that you found a way to bring up somebody even shittier than uh, Billy Crystal. Uh, so, but it's true. <laughs> and, and also, I mean, I, I, but again, you mentioned Mr. Sarian and well, I, Nathan I, Hale. There's a real world no example Carter. of a guy watching Sid Caesar, Caesar and seething as he was doing it and yeah. saying, why is it my show being lauded the way 100%. that... Uh, totally, yeah. Yeah, so anyway. Yeah. So All there right. you go, guys, and, uh, and everybody watching. Wait, and isn't there a TV show now that's using the same premise again? Uh, Not, the same premise as what? The, 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 the Mr. Saturday Night sort of thing where oh. some... You know, and, and I'm not talking about uh, hack. Uh, no, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, no. there are a billion TV shows, and I, I can't keep I know up there's too many TV shows. It's a waste of time to even bring them up. But another show, is it focusing on like the 50s? And yeah, like, oh, know, well, like, uh, well, well the, this Marvelous Ms. May. Yeah. yeah. Well, not, yeah. it's not that, but the, yeah, I guess there are a lot of comedian shows uh, now, like yeah. of the time period. Yeah. Nice, nice costuming. <laughs> yeah, I'll say that about that show. I um, like that show. I'll admit it. <laughs> it's it's okay. It's it's okay. Um, it, as much of it as I watch was okay. Um, so uh, next, uh, uh, so next week we're gonna do um, uh, "You Are There," which uh, is a is a pretty interesting show. It's uh, um, you know Walter Cronkite is on it as a uh, as a sort of reporter investigating historical moments and uh you know and talking directly to the characters in the moment where uh, he's traveling through time he can travel yeah. through time walter cronkite exactly and um it was uh it's actually uh the there were half hour episodes we'll probably end up watching two of them one of the ones i want to look at is the death of socrates it was directed by uh cindy lumet uh but the uh, but the uh we but uh, a lot of what distinguishes this show is that they hired blacklisted writers who are then uh, telling stories that very pointedly are talking about the circumstances of the kind of Red Scare 50s, but through, uh, you know, smuggled, you know, in this television show, uh, you know, and talking about it in historical terms in order to avoid, you know, like, you know, being completely obvious about it. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, they're, you know, writers like Abraham Polanski, who was blacklisted, worked on it. And, you know, it, it's uh, it's a really interesting show. So, uh, um, you know, we'll take a look at that next week. Absolutely. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, Sidney Lumet, uh, the fine director, came from You Are There. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun uh, exploring that. No, I'm really glad you suggested it, dude. That's, uh, that's going to be a great example of uh, the early days of television, which is yeah. what we explore here every week. So uh, from us here at Kinescope, we thank you for watching and listening. And we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, everybody. See ya. Our report details how advertising through television transforms strangers to your product into acquaintances and acquaintances into friends and friends into customers. You could almost say, as a result, 
The television puts into every living room a selling machine.